So let's start at the beginning, ish. You might think that little sentence is simple and logical, but it's not. What gives here? Okay, well, for a start, there's a lot of debate about who were the first humans to employ what we now term mathematics. Many historians believe that numerical markings found on bones in Africa dating from 35,000 to 20,000 years ago indicate the excellent work of our first nerds. But this area is shades of grey for a couple of reasons. Firstly, many of the objects that we have found are damaged or incomplete, so it's not absolutely clear what those objects were used for. And secondly, the ages of some of these pieces are hard to pin down because, well, to be honest, these things didn't exactly come with a date stamped on them or a receipt in case you wanted to take them back to the shop when you'd finished doing whatever it was that you did. So from the outset, I'll give some apologies. Apologies to fans of the Le Bombo boat, a 44,000 year old baboon's fibula found between South Africa and Swaziland, which may have been a lunar calendar used by African women to chart their fertility. Also some apologies to lovers of the 30,000 year old Czechoslovakian wolf bone and various others, including an amazing 80,000 year old piece found in Namibia. Apologies to you one and all because today I'll be telling you about the Ashango bone. Also made from a baboon's fibula, they were clearly very popular back in the day. The Ashango bone was discovered around 1960 in what was then the Belgian Congo, which is now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. It might have been a type of ancient tally stick. At the tip of the bone is a piece of quartz, which may have been used for writing. But it's when we move down to the body of the bone that we math geeks get pretty excited. Why? Well, the Ashengo bone contains scratches, three groups of scratches. In one group, we see three notches alongside its double, six. Similarly for four, which doubles to eight, and five, which doubles to 10. One group is composed of all prime numbers, while another group are all within one of multiples of 10. The two outer groups contain in total 60 scratches. The center group has 48. Both these numbers, 60 and 48, are multiples of 12. In fact, I've read one research paper suggesting it was the tool of a community that understood numbers arranged in powers of 12, not powers of 10, like the counting system that we use. Whatever their meaning, I and many other people believe these markings must be mathematical, and I tip my hat to our ancestors for getting their groove on so early in the piece. Of course, there are other explanations. Some people believe these markings represent phases of the moon and seasons, the sort of things that would have been necessary to understand in order to manage crop harvests. Other people still have suggested, outrageously IMHO, that the markings were simply scratches on a handle so that whoever was using the tool could get a better grip. You can see what I mean when I say there's a lot of debate around this subject. While the Ashango bone may not indicate particularly sophisticated mathematics, the consensus among those in the know is that the markings are just evidence of a basic type of counting or tallying, it does show that extremely ancient civilizations understood the concept of amounts and they may have also recognised the importance of charting the passage of time. Not a bad effort for a prehistoric baboon's fibula, if you ask me. When it comes to the mathematics of the ancient world, Pythagoras was the man. Not only was he believed to have come up with the very terms philosophy, love of wisdom, and mathematics, that which is learned, he was also the first to work out a complete system of mathematics, a system within which geometric elements corresponded with numbers. Born in Samos, an island off the coast of present-day Turkey, sometime around 570 BC, Pythagoras was not far from Miletus, where the great Thales lived. In fact, Pythagoras may well have studied at the feet of the sage. When he moved to Croton, in what is now the southern tip of Italy, he established a school of religion and philosophy that believed, among other things, that numbers were the basis of everything. Members of his school, which included some of the first ever female philosophers, were responsible for some of the greatest mathematical discoveries of the era. Pythagoras is probably best known for his Pythagorean theorem. This epic piece of mathematics says that in a right angled triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Huh? 
What he's saying is that when a triangle has one angle equal to 90 degrees, if the lengths of the sides are A, B, and C, as we have labeled here, Pythagoras' theorem tells us that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Remember that A squared is just A multiplied by itself. The most well-known Pythagorean triangle has sides of lengths three, four, and five, giving us the famous equality three squared plus four squared equals five squared. If you're feeling frisky, grab a pen and paper and convince yourself that three times three plus four times four equals five times five. Now, Pythagoras was not actually the first person to notice this beautiful relationship between shapes and numbers. There are versions of this formula in ancient Indian, Chinese, Babylonian and other texts. Some argue the Egyptians could not have built the pyramids with such precision without appreciating that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But of course, this was well before the internet and cheap international air travel, so we can safely assume that no one was deliberately ripping anyone else off. They all came to the same conclusion, a beautiful conclusion, but it's the P-man who gets his name on the formula. And why not? As I said, he was the man. Now here's one proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Hopefully, you'll remember from primary school that the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. So the area of these yellow triangles with sides A, B and C is a half times AB. The area of the orange square in the center with sides C is C squared. And the area of the much larger square is A plus B all squared, which any 14 year old will tell you expands to A squared plus B squared plus 2AB. But the area of the biggest square is also clearly equal to that of the smallest square plus the area of the four triangles. So we get A squared plus B squared plus 2AB must be equal to the inner square plus the four triangles, C squared plus four lots of a half AB. This all simplifies down to A squared plus B squared plus 2AB equals C squared plus 2AB. Remove the 2AB from each side and you're left with a beautiful A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And if that looks suspiciously to you like the Pythagorean theorem, well, that's because it is, my good friend. There are literally thousands of proofs of the Pythagorean theorem, no less than James Garfield, the 20th president of the United States, once came up with a proof during a debate on mathematics in Congress. <laughs> Back at you, Obama. One fascinating implication of the Pythagorean theorem comes from making a right angled triangle with both shorter sides equal to one. The formula tells you that the longer side is then generated by C squared equals one squared plus one squared. So C squared equals one plus one equals two. Therefore, the hypotenuse C must be the square root of two units in length. This suddenly opens the can of worms that is irrational numbers. If you've not heard of them, don't panic, I'll explain it all in a moment. But suffice to say that for the Pythagoreans, this can of worms was quite a wormy can indeed. Legend has it that the discovery of root two totally freaked them out. Apparently, one of the philosophers, Hippasus of Metapontum, threatened to spill the beans, so they drowned him at sea. So it seems even the Pythagoreans believed snitches get stitches. Hate to interrupt. Would you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by comedian, broadcaster, and mathematician Adam Spencer, completely ad-free. So what does it mean for the square root of two to be irrational? And how do we prove it to be so? Well, irrational here is a potentially confusing word. It doesn't mean the square root of two can't be trusted or sometimes acts a bit weird. To understand the word irrational, Think of the part of it that says the word ratio. So a rational number is one that can be written as a ratio or a fraction involving two counting numbers, one on top called the numerator, one below called the denominator. So three quarters is rational, as is nine fifths or negative 27 on 1,234, one on 100 million billion, etc. But the square root of two freak people out because it can't be written as a fraction involving two whole numbers. Now, don't just take my word for it. Let's look at a proof given to us by another one of the all-time greats of mathematics, another Greek geek, this one named Euclid. It is indeed one of the most beautiful and important pieces of mathematics in the ancient world, the proof that the square root of two is an irrational number. 
Now this just means it cannot be written as a fraction n over m where n and m are whole numbers. Once we knew this, a whole new class of numbers opened up before us, the irrationals. Here's the essence of the brilliant Greek mathematician at Euclid's proof. It's a proof by contradiction, in which we assume that root two is rational and then show this leads to all manner of mathematical mayhem. One thing we know about fractions is that if the two numbers in the fraction have a common factor, for example, 14 over 21, we can cancel this down. In this case, we divide the top and bottom by seven to leave the fraction two over three. Any such fraction can be reduced to a simplest form. So let's say that root two is a rational number. This means we can write root two equals n over m, where n and m are whole numbers with no common factor apart from the obvious common factor of one. And this fraction n over m cannot be further simplified. Well, if root two equals n over m, then squaring both sides maintains the equality, giving us root two squared equals m squared on m squared, or two equals n squared on m squared. Therefore, n squared equals 2m squared. We can see that 2m squared must be even. It clearly has a factor of two. That means n squared is also even. But you should be able to see by squaring a few even and odd numbers yourself that if n squared is even, n must also be even. Well, if n is even, we can write n equals 2k, where k is another whole number. This means that n squared is 2k all squared, or 4k squared. And from earlier, we had that n squared equals 2m squared. But this means that 4k squared equals 2m squared, or 2k squared equals m squared. So by the same logic we used a few seconds ago, that means if m squared is even, m must be even. This is a problem because if n and m are both even, we could have simplified the fraction n over m by dividing both the even numbers n and m by two. But we started all of this by assuming the fraction n over m could not be further simplified. So by assuming that apart from one, there is no common factor for n and m, leads to n and m having a common factor. This contradiction shows us there were no numbers n over m in the first place where root two equaled n over m. Root two is not a rational number. Brilliant stuff. Not quite worth throwing the guy over a side of the boat to his death as far as I'm concerned, but a brilliant insight into the world of irrational numbers. For our final piece of ancient mathematics, let's take a step back and re-familiarise ourselves with the concept of zero. Zilch, nada, zip, whatever takes your fancy, it's indeed a curious tale. Because though human beings have most probably always understood the concept of nothing or having nothing, the concept of zero is a relatively new one. It only became fully operational in around the fifth century. Before then, mathematicians all over the shop struggled to do even the most basic calculations. Today, zero, both as a symbol or numeral, and a concept, meaning the absence of any quantity, allows us to do all sorts of amazing stuff like calculus, complicated equations, running national economies, smashing opponents in a game of football. Zero and its good buddy one sit at the heart of all computers. For something so abstract, it's incredibly real and important. For example, when you think about the number 100, 200, 5,000, you probably just see a digit followed by a bunch of zeros. But in each of these numbers, the zero works like a placeholder. It's the three zeros in 5,000 that tell us there are five thousands, not five hundreds or five millions. If you added or subtracted even a single zero, it radically alters the amount. Now, the Babylonians were probably the first people to come up with a mark to signify that a number was absent from a column just as the zeros in 1050 show there is no hundreds or no units in that number. After the Babylonians, the ancient Greeks, who stood on the shoulder of the ancient Egyptians, actually made little progress on the whole zero debate. It wasn't until about 650 AD that an Indian mathematician named Brahmagupta from Binmal landed the killer blow. Brahmagupta was a superstar. Famous science historian George Sarton once called him one of the greatest scientists of his race and the greatest of his time. To represent zero, Brahmagupta used dots underneath numbers, which were referred to as sunya, meaning simply empty, or ka, meaning place. Brahmagupta understood how you could reach zero through addition, subtraction, as well as the result of various operations with zero. He didn't quite crack division by zero. That concept wouldn't be understood until Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz got busy and invented calculus hundreds of years later. But I digress. 
We'd also have to wait another 200 years or so after the B train before the circular representation of zero on a tablet in Gwalior. But hey, don't hold that against Brahmagupta. The man made something out of nothing. <laughs> Tough crowd. He was a bona fide genius.